session for the St. Mary's Planning Commission to consider the recommendations of the City uh, Council of the adoption of the new zoning plan. Uh, for the, we welcome all of you. This is, uh, this is about 60 or 70 more people than we normally see. Um, we have a work session which will be followed at around 6.30 by a regular, or rather a special call meeting. Um, the work session is a process whereby the um, Planning Commission uh, sits to hear information regarding a particular subject uh, from invited uh, guests, in this case uh, the Community Development Director. It is not a public hearing. There is no opportunity for public comment. Uh, it is strictly informational and uh, when appropriate, uh, the Planning Commission can engage in a discussion with uh, the Community Planning Director or anyone else who's invited to speak. In this case, uh, no one other than Jeff has been invited to speak. Uh, those are basically the ground rules for the work session. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover, so Mr. Adams, if you would kindly uh, take the podium or sit where you are. Yeah, I'm um, going to stay here if that's okay. Yeah. And I've, I've set it up to where if we do need any, can you hear that? Yeah, okay. I think you may have to hold the mic. Okay. Up. And, and so uh, we've set it up to where if we need uh, for reference anything, the map or the ordinance or anything, I have the ability to go on that. So it's up to you guys if you want to go through it section by section. Or So uh, what I have uh, sent you and what's before you is a zoning uh, work session outline which I thought just kind of walks through the main uh, suggestions and changes which is built back from that original zoning changes um, are there any other seats open I should move that map down off that chair and use that one too okay go ahead and use that chair yeah move that map down up y'all can't see it where you're sitting and it looks like there's uh, and so this I thank everyone for coming out tonight and this gives us a good gauge for the council meetings we're going to hold those when we hold hearings uh, we'll make better arrangements we're going to hold those before like we did uh, hopefully for the Millside rezone we'll hold those over at the school so we can have a larger Form for those, uh, and uh, likely, if I know the city council, will be more than one hearing, so they'll get it. You'll all get a chance to speak at that, uh, and to uh, 
once again state what uh, the commissioner, uh, the chair said, uh, work sessions don't usually uh, allow, it's up to them at their discretion if they want to allow any public comment, uh, but they closed public comment uh, last Friday at five o'clock, and so it's, it's at their discretion to reopen public comment. They can choose to make a decision tonight at the public meeting, and then that recommendation will go to the city council where there will be uh, public hearings held. And at those public hearings, you will then get to see what's that recommended uh, draft ordinance that's before them, which gives you kind of that final draft uh, to read over and or call me up and ask questions about. So uh, that's what's on the plate for tonight. And, uh, and uh, the schedule meetings, we go uh, next week to uh, a retreat, a staff and council retreat with the uh, city council and that's it at that uh, at that uh, retreat they're going to decide the dates they want to hear that i would say it's going to probably be mid mid december and, and early january okay uh, we will let as soon as that probably end of next week is when i would anticipate coming out with that schedule and so because we have to go uh, Georgia state statute says 15 to 45 days we have to go out with the legal notices on those for uh, that public hearing uh, for the last year in this session. Uh, but we better get going here uh, and then we'll, uh, if we have other questions later on, I can entertain those. Uh, so up to you guys, I would, thought we would work through, like I said, this uh, zoning work session outline and then uh, go through that we can go through and I can take questions at each one of those or afterwards we can kind of go on anything that I missed that you guys want to discuss and talk about um, and I just wanted to also notify you that from this work session outline that I've started on I've drafted uh, some uh, the, the necessary amendments to the draft ordinance that would be required and so if we go into the public hearing we'll have a document to work from that reflects kind of these points and i'll amend that that's what i'll be doing is taking notes as we go through and so we'll have a draft document to work from that way that that can go to uh fairly easy to you guys just kind of adopting that as a uh, form of reference when you go to the motion if you decide to do the motion okay can you guys hear me and understand me yes okay so uh, is that guy, is that okay with you all? Yes, it is. Okay. So uh, first off uh, was planned developments, uh, and they have agreements, uh, as we've said many times, with the city, uh, and are not affected by these changes. Um, I ran uh, that these suggestions by uh, Connie Cooper, our consultant, and she gave me some language which I'm going to read that she, she uh, would like inserted to just clarify that plan development uh, language. And it says plant B, section 1.04B plan development districts one, existing plan development districts that are fully developed shall be permitted to continue as developed. Two, existing plan development districts that are not fully developed but have approved development agreements and detailed development plans such as proposed land uses, densities, lot layouts, street configurations, multifamily and non-residential building locations, and parking, dimensional standards, setbacks, lot coverage, etc., and landscaping that have been submitted and approved by the city shall be permitted to develop in accordance with their approved plan. Three, existing plan development districts that have approved development agreements that are not fully developed and do not have detailed development plans as enumerated above, shall be required to submit applications for site development plan approval as required by the zoning order prior to going forward with development. So it's just clarifying the fact that uh, if you already have a uh, CCNRs or HOA plan development, then those are uh, these ordinances won't uh, affect you. Okay. Are there any questions for me? Um, commission members on this item. Okay. Okay. 
So number two, it's about lot sizes and A, cottage houses in the form-based districts proposed for a minimum lot size of 3,000 as written in this draft, of the October 10th draft. Uh, staff recommends cottage houses as permitted in DVR, so that would be permitted in the DVR of the form-based district, special use in the DTR and DMS, and clarification that it's 5,000 of a minimum lot size of a detached. And, and I think that's kind of confusing in the table. And so I want everyone to understand that we're saying that in these form-based districts, a cottage house can be built on a 5,000 square foot uh, lot, okay? Not the, the 3,000 is only for those clusters, okay? And so that's a little confusing. And uh, this changes it by only permitting it, in other words, without coming in and getting conditional through me or a special use through the Planning Commission, you guys, that it's that's only in the DVR area. And then special use, which would go before you guys, would be for the DTR and the DMS areas. Any questions? Comments? Okay. Yeah. B. Cottage court clusters. So this was uh, this is one of those where I think there's some misunderstanding out there in the public. They require a minimum of 22,400 square feet, okay, to do a cottage court cluster. So you have to have pretty much a half acre to do one of these developments, uh, and I recommend approval of that. Okay. Uh, C R one. Currently calls for minimum lot width of 75. As we have many lots under 75 throughout the city with variances, I recommend 60 as the lot width since we're going to the smaller lots and uh, this would fit with that and also uh, allow many of these variances that uh, you guys deal with all the time to go forward. Anyone have any objection to a change of 60 feet instead of 75? Okay. D, setbacks. Currently, Osprey Cove, Sugar Mill, Cumberland Harbor, and many of the variances allowed across the city in the past 10 years for, set, are for setbacks of 10 feet or less. The fire chief has approved these setbacks, recommends setback reductions. Any objections? <coughs> okay. Uh, design guidelines. Uh, the building materials, primary and secondary, these materials make up the majority of homes built in the city. Uh, recommend adding stucco, brick, and cement block as secondary or accent, accent materials. And I would say that that is my reading of it. I asked Connie to clarify that, and so she's just going to clarify that in the language. So that, that's for all of those, okay? Probably just go through all of these. Okay. Are sub, sub letter. Okay. B, colors, recommend approval. C, removal? I mean, excuse me, removal. Yes. So anything to do with colors, I recommend removal of that language. Strike it. Okay. C, accessory structures, except for detached garages, are limited to rear yard, and I recommend approval of that. Uh, D, paved garage or carport required for every two bedrooms. I recommend approval. Uh, e, garages even or behind front facade. I recommend consider cons your consideration and the HBC's consideration of that. Um, my feeling is that this is done in many communities, uh, but are we at that point where we need to do that? Personally, from my uh, experience with other communities, we do not have the, this big of a problem with this, where uh, the snub-nosed garages or the, the garages that are out in front, I don't see that as just kind of that cookie-cutter pattern that's normally done in a lot of communities. I don't think that's our problem. So, you know, if it's, if it's up to me, we strike that. Yeah, I, uh, my, my comment would be is that to the extent that the code would allow it in a plan development, 
I don't think that there ought to be a discriminatory basis between planned and non-planned just because uh, uh, the plan development has the option to, to get that so that we ought to have the same regime through the whole city, yeah. which, would, which would mean striking that portion of the uh, recommended language that garages do not extend beyond the front uh, facade of the house. I mean, I think it's one of those things, if we see this as a pattern that we're, we're starting to have problems with, we can amend this to, you know, to warn us later, so. Okay, next. Definitions. Uh, recommend stat state statute language, recommend approval of all the state statute language for manufacturers and other homes. G, roof pitch, recommend approval of the roof, roof pitch. H, office commercial multifamily design guidelines, I recommend approval of those. Uh, any other thoughts on those or questions? Does anyone have any questions or thoughts on these recommended changes? Okay. okay. Four, ADUs are proposed as conditional use in all residential and form-based districts, except MH. Recommend special use for R1 districts and recommend the approval of the others. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Number five, tiny houses are proposed as a special use in R2, R3, and the form-based districts as part of an ADU or a cottage court cluster uh, housing. Where they were where they require a minimum of five units per lot at 3,000 square feet. And uh, I say for 15,000 square feet. And yet, as I stated earlier, you still have to have 22,400 square feet just to do a cottage courtyard, okay? So recommend, as above, with one exception, that R2 and R3 should allow a condition <coughs> conditional use for individual tiny homes on individual lots of 3,000 square feet or greater. And that's for the R2 and three, R3 districts. Is the conditional use going to be, would that come before the commission or would that be approved? The that, that comes before me and then if it's appealed it would come uh, to you guys. All right, any comments about making that conditional uh, use? Okay. Number six, special uses. Recommend approval to change to running with the land. Number seven, infrastructure viability. Not typically a zoning issue. Recommended by master plan to update stormwater protections and plans and other infrastructural concerns with the master plan's number one priority, a comprehensive resource allocation and capital improvement plan. Uh, so that's really just saying that uh, this is the zoning ordinance, and uh, although it uh, targets certain uses and densities and things like that, it's not where uh, stormwater, uh, streets, and other things are usually handled. Those are to be handled. That's what we'll be talking about in our retreat next week with the council on the game plan for not only a comprehensive resource allocation and capital improvement plan, but doing a stormwater utility and uh, protection plan. Um, so, number eight, uses. Are proposed to be more flexible throughout the city with many conditional and some special use recommended. Minor changes to table two, making it a special use for single family detached estate, village, and cottage houses in the uh, DMS district. Uh, so uh, slightly changing that table to uh, not allow kind of these smaller homes in that downtown corridor area, Main Street area. And then uh, single family detached cottage houses would be permitted in the DVR as we discussed earlier. Special use in Table 3 for outdoor storage, screened, and telecommunication towers of over 60 feet in the DMS district. And this is mainly because we currently have those. Uh, we allow those already 
uh, and we, we do that for special use now, and I see no reason where they can <coughs> cause problems and recommend to just uh, change that. Is that less than or greater than 60 feet? That is greater than, yeah. And so uh, we have a facility that's kind of, it's, it's hidden pretty much from view, but it's there. And so if someone wanted to come in and change that, I'd, I'd say it'd still go before special use, but it's, they should be allowed to do that. Uh, any thoughts, any questions? All right. Thank you. Number nine, mapping. Form-based code. Are the boundaries appropriate? Recommend approval with recommendations from the Historic Preservation Committee. Uh, we had a work session with the HPC on Tuesday night, and uh, they will have their recommendations at their regular meeting, which is also a public hearing, so you're allowed to also speak up on the downtown form based districts at that meeting at the end of the month. Uh, and so uh, B, tiny homes recommend allowing, as I said earlier, R2 and R3 as conditional use for individual tiny homes on individual lots of 3,000 square feet or greater. C, RVs recommend review of industrial lands capacities. Uh, this is something that we have not really discussed. It was brought up in the master plan uh, quite a bit. And we have an RV trailer, a kind of a park uh, section that has never been used in our current ordinance. And so it was struck from this ordinance. And so the only places that RVs can be placed and utilized are in industrial lands right now. Uh, and so I would recommend that we approve this ordinance as it is, but I, I do recommend that we look at that uh, as a the planning commission uh, in, in the coming year, just to look at that. And if we want RV parks, where would we want those in the city? Well, uh, we're not gonna have an RV district. Is that, or is we don't, we don't right now. No, we don't and we don't have it in the ordinance. So if it's necessary and we want to have an RV district, we have not had one in the past and we've had that, that ability because we've had that district as a, uh, a zoning district, but it's never been placed on the map, if that makes sense to everyone. Uh, so no one's ever used it. So if that's, yeah. Uh, RV one, but we, we brought it in through um, uh, annexation out there. No. Crooked River? No. Big well? Well? No. And an area was annexed first, and he came before the planning yeah. commission got approved for it to be after it was put in the yeah. RV ordinance. Yeah. We, so you've got one <coughs> RV part now. Yeah. We haven't had it since that one as well. No. Yeah, that in it. So. Why do you want to tell them where it's at? Yeah. Do what? Do you want to tell them where it's located? It's off of uh, Charlie Smith Senior Highway, per 40, out towards uh, Crooked Bluff, Crooked River State Park. How about the one at the hospital? Hmm? How about the one at the hospital? There's one where? At the hospital, out of 40, or Spur. RV Park? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Change it to an R4 as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I don't think it's zoned that. So. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's my recommendation. Yeah. D, manufacture mobile and industrial buildings. I recommend approval with insertion of the state's industrial building language. That's currently not in this draft, and I've got that language here. Uh, if you want me to read it when we go to the uh, recommendation, the motion. Uh, E, heavy industrial, recommend consideration of whether this is still a needed district in St. Mary's, and by extension, is this the appropriate location? Currently on the map that's over there, the only heavy industrial, or what used to be called general industrial area that is still on our zoning map, we've left it where it is on, in this new draft, and that is that the, uh, the box plant uh, area, uh, off of uh, 40. Uh, that is in that area. There's there's two parcels, I believe, that are general industrial over there. That has been relabeled as heavy industrial. Uh, and 
I recommend approval, but that's another one of those things that when we decide to, uh, you know, do we need this in, in moving forward? Uh, because the port, uh, the latest, our latest rezone of the port, uh, the mill site, that is, would be a light industrial district mainly uh, with some port and marine facilities as part of it. Uh, anything that's kind of over that has to be a special use. Uh, so, I kind of bring that up to you guys to think about and decide what you want to do with that. Well, let me ask you about that because when I look at the table, um, there are some uses that would be conditional or special in the heavy industrial that would not be permitted in any other um, in any other district. I don't, I don't even know if we have room for them in in the parcel that the only parcel we have under this plan is heavy industrial and the, the question I would have is, as I look at this um, for instance um, the heavy industrial allows a fuel station without a store the question I would have is if we just make the heavy if we just consolidate industrial in a single industrial zone do we want to allow a fuel station without a store in the regular industrial zone or not or is that a good idea um, well that's because you know <coughs> say for like a port facility other facilities often they need that just like our um, uh, over in our industrial area we have that as part of our public works so you have these fueling stations that are really are for those industries yeah but i don't it's it's uh, i guess it's allowed in a commercial district right yeah and a special district like planned development um are there any thoughts here about whether we should have just that single parcel that is heavy industrial it's, it's, it's a, box a, it's a couple here. couple parcels right there together what is the airport airport is currently light industrial and uh, you know I'm happy to answer questions but it's really a work session so you would really he would have to yeah, offer that in the future yeah uh, so airports a light industrial right now but it is going through a, a market study right now and hopefully by this time next year we'll have a whole new zoning associated with that Does anyone have any feelings about whether we should just kick that can down the road and leave that the, the box factory and that, that surrounding area as heavy industrial, or just? I think we should leave it. I, I, I'm not in favor of us turning around and driving everybody who's been part of St. Mary's out of St. Mary's. They're fine. They work there. They're part of our community. They pay taxes. If necessary, we pass it down the road. Okay. Yeah, I and, guess we'll, uh, and it's a good point that you know I think that. This market analysis just for the airport will also give us an understanding of how much industrial we need you know, in the future. So I, I expect we may be looking at more map changes next year. So. Okay, so next up is, uh, let me see if I can, auto, yeah, auto sales lease, recommend limiting uh, auto sales and lease facilities or new ones to Charlie Smith uh, Sr. from 40 to Kings Bay Road. Uh, Kings Bay Road from four, Charlie Smith Sr. to 40, and then 40 from Kings Bay Road to Charlie Smith, and so that triangle. Uh, GR3 has been expanded. I recommend approval of that in the draft map. Okay. Uh, 10, outdoor storage and display. Recommend some provision be made for retail hardware or building supplies when properly screened or buffered. Uh, 11. Home occupations and home based businesses. I recommend approval with additional language for A5 that expands storage to up to 1,000 cubic feet of non toxic or volatile materials approved by the fire chief to be uh, stored at home. Uh, Number, any questions or any thoughts? Okay. Number 12, ground story heights. 
are essential to provide office and commercial reuse and the new building height measured from the ground is a nationally accepted practice. I recommend approval with a change to the fourth footnote of Table 5 of Section 3.03 .03 to read not exceed two feet above the FEMA freeboard elevation. Currently it says FEMA uh, base flood elevation, which means you couldn't really build. Uh, so this allows two foot of variance once you go above the freeboard. A column to clarify heights um, for each form and a graphic to clarify language of section 4.04. Uh, I, I told Connie that I found that the this section is missing its column on the, uh, the building heights and a graphic that explains this and spoke with uh, Mr. Johnson and we both agree it's a confusing section and we would like to clarify that when it hits City Council. Okay. okay. Uh, I guess I put, I missed a 13, but 14, administration, recommend 7.01.B1, read, it shall be unlawful to cut or remove vegetation or excavate or fill any parcel, lot, or tract of land other than activities related to landscaping or repairs within an existing development without first obtaining a land disturbance permit for such work from the Community Development Department. So this is uh, part of the administration process. Uh, right now, we uh, there's a little uh, vagary between anything uh, uh, under, uh, say, two acres, and this would have everyone at least come in and get a zoning approval before they come in. And then if we can then check the wetlands designation and then let them know if they need to do that kind of work. And, uh, so, any questions on that? Number 15, nonconformist. Oh, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't affect any owner's obligation to contact uh, the, the Miss Utility uh, hotline? Uh, no, but we, we could refer them to do that. And it's not, that's not usually in ordinance, but we'll do that. If, uh, well, I don't know that we need it. I, I think that's <coughs> pretty common. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we would we would tell them that at the building. It's in the building package. Yeah. Okay, fifteen, nonconformance. Recommend providing more lenient lenient language. And so, I'm I'm going to read this uh, uh, chair into into the record so that people understand this. Uh, B, non-conforming structures is what this is about, and it's number two, continuance of a lawful non-conforming structure. Okay, so under that B, section B, so that uh, would be B to B, uh, a non-conforming structure may be repaired and those portions of the repair retain it in accordance with all permanent building codes in effect at the time of repair, and C, a non-conforming structure may be enlarged, expanded, or extended, or relocated if such change is in conformity with the standards of this zoning ordinance and does not increase the non-conforming conditions of the structure. So this gives uh, someone uh, the ability to uh, do work on their structures and uh, not, if you're putting in a garage and things like that, if it, uh, not have to change their entire um, house and everything to fit the, this new zoning ordinance. It's just that structure that has to fit the zoning ordinance. That's what's, uh, what's stated in there. Any questions on that? Okay, number 16, outdoor storage containers. Recommend minimum five feet for any active building permit. So, uh, speaking with Mr. Johnson, so uh, in the outdoor storage, uh, language right now it says 20 feet uh, from uh, and so uh, when someone's doing a building project often you have to put those outdoor storage containers and facilities while you've got the permit going and needs to put it where you can so we've kind of limited that down and given them a little more room to, to use that while they got an active permit okay 17 automotive oversized commercial and recreational vehicle parking Recommend allowing six months of overnight parking in residential areas for emergencies where an active building permit has been pulled to reconstruct the structure not to exceed one year. 
recommend consideration of limiting each residence to one visible non-screened RV or travel hauling or boat trailer parked behind the front facade line current and, and I'm going to read the current ordinance on this because uh, there's some confusion uh, on you know the trailers RVs and boats and stuff our current language right now for storage and parking of trailers and commercial vehicles and location of off-street parking areas says uh, you know commercial uh, this is 110 125 location and use of off street parking area and it's uh, f it says uh, commercial vehicles and trailers of all types including travel boat camping and hauling should not be parked or stored on any lot occupied by a dwelling or any lot in any district zone residential except in accordance with the following requirements no one no more than one commercial vehicle per dwelling shall be permitted the size of which shall be no larger in size than a pickup truck, panel truck, or van, and is limited in size to a one ton carrying capacity, and in no case shall a commercial vehicle used for hauling explosives, gasoline, or liquefied petroleum products be permitted for parking in the zones noted. But this is the one I'd like everyone to pay attention to. Number two, travel trailers, hauling trailers, or boat trailers, with or without boat, and boats without a trailer shall be permitted if parked or stored behind the front yard setback or behind the building line of the residence or garage if the setback is a greater dimension than the front yard setback as established by ordinance, whichever is greater. Uh, and then it goes on to three and four. Uh, that is a very difficult thing to administer. Uh, and what I mean by administer, we get calls all the time for code enforcement to come out and you know this boat this boat's parked or this travel trailer's parked in the front yard uh, and they have to determine uh, whether it's behind the setback line or the front line and, and it's a very difficult thing when some setback lines go almost to the structure uh, so uh, i tried to make it a little clearer by saying that uh, uh, in an rv or trailer or hauling on a boat trailer to park behind the front facade line and just leave it at the front facade line. Uh, I don't want, there's, this isn't an intention to limit uh, how many someone can have, but if they have more than one that's visible and park behind that front facade, it does need to be uh, uh, screened and buffered from the private view. But they can have as many as they want in the backyard is what we're saying. So that, that's my recommendation. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I rec welcome any discussion on that or, or thoughts on that. Where are we on, where is the code on an owner of commercial or residential property allowing tractor trailers, RVs, and other things to um, park there overnight? gratuitously and, and I'm particularly thinking of the bowling alley and the Walmart parking lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what we're trying to we have language in the new code that will not allow that. Okay. And and it's and it's difficult to enforce against the person who parks the vehicle there. It's clear that the right. owner is responsible for the enforcement. Right. And we have that problem uh, quite a quite a bit in the city, and that's why it's in the, the language is in the current <coughs> to not allow it on a, on a commercial uh, facility. So, so put that up for me. How are we going to tell Walmart has to tell these people to get their RVs out of the parking lot? Well, they're the ones who invite them there in the first place. Yeah, that's what I'm just saying. I, I mean, last weekend there was probably six of them up there. And they're yeah. jumped out and everything. So. Yeah. I do that everywhere. Excuse me. But again, so you're saying we're going to tell Walmart you have to get out there. That is what this intends to do. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. All right. And and I think that I think those are the things that I and I spoke at the HPC work session that I hope that not just. Uh, 
you guys and especially city council will have to think about this through the retreat and coming up to the zoning ordinance when it comes before them that many of these things may and likely will take much more code enforcement than we currently have and so we have to think about the cost of that well yeah except it, it, it is an owner's responsibility and, and if i'm when i'm on the interstate and i see state governments saying no overnight parking or no parking for more than two hours the concern i have is a safety concern in these parking lots where people cross lines or zip behind things your your view is obstructed with these large vehicles and and it's it's it's, it's an eyesore in when you drive down osborne street or any other street in this city and while that's an observation I make. I think it's certainly something we have to decide whether we want to see codified yes. um, or get down the road. Yeah. Right now, it's it's in the code. And I don't see Walmart being too concerned about monitoring that. Or well, they don't have to be. They can just come in and pay the fine. And after so many fines, uh, the you know the aggressive enforcement. Well, that's I said, what you going to do, really, really is with the dust becoming a police state? I mean, is that what you're going to do, Mike? Well, that, that's what we're here to discuss. Are you going to close the door to Walmart? It's not. It, it, it is All I want some answer. Is Are you no. going to close the door to Walmart? No, it's just a... It, it's, it's, it's and then what Kingsland will do, they'll tear Walmart down, and they'll build it in Kingsland. Right. And right. they'll enjoy right. all the stuff that Walmart is going to do. I understand that, and all I'm suggesting, and the reason I brought it up, is that we have that provision in the proposed code. And if it's not something you want in the code, yes. then I think we have to. Very good point. You we have need to, to say to Jeff, strike take that out of the code because we don't want it in the code. Okay. It, it looks like there's a consensus that we don't want it in the code. I missed that one. Yeah. I missed that one. Yeah. yeah. In, in, and I'm getting the sense that I put that in the motion to strike. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I mean, the purpose of the session is to make sure that we are clear on, on items like that. Well, yeah, a lot of this stuff, until you actually start looking at the day to day, how are you going to enforce this, is not real clear. I mean, I'm reading in here saying the self serve storage of vehicles, such as <coughs> with the hippo storage up here that has RVs and boats and things parked. The way I'm reading this, not more, not unless I want to build a building to put it in there. Well, we have probably now. Not. I mean, Charlie Smith would be happy with that because if we're talking, this story. is worth. Uh, but can I first say that this, the first thing that we spoke about? So let's get this correct. 5.06. That's A2. It says no oversized commercial vehicle or recreational vehicle shall be parked overnight within a non-residential lot unless a part of the business's daily permitted operation has a current. License or permit to operate within the state of Georgia and is parked on a paved surface that is specifically designed for the parking of such vehicles. Okay, then you bring up that paved surface thing, and we all know where that's going in the next few months. It's the stormwater authority, so they can tax them some more because you pay for more property. Okay, we can't call it a tax because it's an authority, but it's a tax. So it sounds like another way to generate income by we're telling everybody, yep, you've got to have more parking for your cars, and now we're going to tax you on that more parking. So, well, so you know, so you're a lot saying of things you're recommending this. striking that is what I'm saying from what I'm hearing. So. Well, you're, you're talking 506 is limited to residential or foreign-based district. It's not, it doesn't There's apply to commercial or industrial. Uh, you go to the self-service one out here. Yeah, it's very confusing for me, anyway, at times. Let me find a little paragraph on that here. Yeah, those are my um, uh, section five point two four. And not in this room, but we will in this So I read section five point two four as applying to, for instance, hippo storage up here on. Okay, so. I, I agree with you. I think that that's, that's kind of in, inconsistent. That's saying that they want to store these 
some of us to park a boat or RV there it has to be parked on inside of a building and there's just all kinds of interesting things. That, well, there's not a building up there right now. There's a lot of RVs and boats there. I think it's a service to the community, obviously they pay for it, but you can't park them in the yards. This is park them yeah. Somewhere. So this would be for a new facility, right? Is what we're saying. Okay. So then you can pretty much take it away with the oh I can't compete with you because I have to buy yeah. on this start so one. I have to have a huge building. You don't. I mean it's just a lot of it's a lot to think about. Well, do you, do you have an objection to the whole section or to just that subsection? We'll move on right now, so section we're good. I just want to make my comments. Well, yeah, yeah, it may be worth the discussion because we're, we're creating, um, we're allowing a non-conforming use to continue, to create, that would create a non-conforming use that could continue right. and create an economic hardship well, they, they, yeah, and we can, if they expanded and put in new paving, I mean new road or new circulation, they would have to pave that new circulation. Doesn't mean they have to go back and do the old. Well, I'm looking at the fully enclosed building part of it. Yeah, that's yeah. the part that bothered me, the fully enclosed building. Yeah, if they put in a new facility, it would have to be fully enclosed. According so to that's what I'm saying is pretty much Dippo Storage then would have the market. He's got it. No one can compete with him because nobody else could open one of those businesses and well, be able to afford it. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm... That's just a for instance. I would, yes, but I think that's a for instance, but also, it's also a market. And so the market might be that they someone would compete with them with a enclosed facility, and that's the market that they're trying, the niche they're trying to fill. I'm just saying there's ways of looking at that, there and is. that's one way, okay? Yep. okay. Are there, are there any feelings about whether we should keep that in or, or allow that to be a uh, part of the new code? Are there any other recommendations? That's all that I had. I would like to go through anyone else thoughts or sections or questions that you have. I think the one um, one observation we can make is uh, as we have experienced uh, a number of other occasions when we're confronted with something that presents a conundrum or a hardship um, even in uh, the time that I've been on this commission, we passed several text amendments uh, so that um, our ability not to be uh, sitting in concrete boots uh, uh, would be relieved because we would have the ability to recommend to the council changes to the zoning code as we go forward uh, if we find that there is a um, harsh result uh, that, that has been created because of a, a clause, whether it's one we've just looked at or one that we aren't even aware of within. Uh, yes, this will not be perfect, I can tell you. We're going to find, uh, you know, issues as we move through this. And I said to today's HPC at their work session, you know, uh, I, I honestly feel that uh, waiting from 94 to today is one of the reasons why there's a room full of people here, you know, this should be more of a, a ongoing living document. That's what zoning ordinances are for. Uh, the, it's the people's right to petition, it's the planning commission, it's the council to change these things and update them and keep them up to date. And so uh, this, is the, this is the first attempt to do that, and, but definitely not the last thing we're gonna be looking at. We've still got signage to look at coming up. We've got uh, other things, and a lot of these things connect in parts to this, so. I'm concerned about, like you said, it's been so long since the update, and I, I mean, I agree. We certainly need it. We needed it 20, obviously 20 so years ago, as we were just still growing and starting to grow a lot. Um, unfortunately, the governments didn't get together too well in those days, but um, 
what concerns me now is all these little nuances that could be starting a domino effect somewhere else that we can't see right now. And that really concerns me about the whole document. Sure. I, I know it's, it's, it's difficult to do uh, comprehensive changes. Uh, but then again, you know, you have to take that step and you correct them as you go. And, uh, you know, I can only say that uh, this, is, this is a step in the right direction and that's, you'll, you'll find changes that you're going to have to make. I'm not going to, you know, I can't say that this is the perfect ordinance. I'll never see a perfect ordinance. Right. Just so that we're clear, you've made recommendations where we haven't said no. Um, we are all um, conveying the impression to Mr. Adams that where we have not said no expressly, those are going to be attached, the, the, the recommendations he's made are going to be attached to the motion, uh, whatever motion is made. Uh, when we go into the uh, special call meeting. So if there's any change that you would like to be recommendations he's made, uh, we have the next 10 minutes to, to let him know. But uh, he was, uh, the process will be uh, that, Mr. that Mr. Adams is going to um, draft the motion uh, or, or draft um, language to a motion because it's not just going to be a motion to approve the code as drafted. It's going to be whether or not to approve the code as drafted with the recommendations made in the work session. Uh, and that probably will be a two or three page motion. And I've asked, I did ask Mr. Adams earlier to make sure that copies were available so that everyone who's in attendance here would be able to see it. We're not going to work in the dark. We want you to see the language um, that's going to be considered during the uh, special call meeting. Uh, are there any other matters that anyone wants to bring up as part of the work session? No. Why don't we, pardon? No. Why don't we adjourn the work session? We will convene in nine minutes for the special call meeting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there is. Uh, yeah, it looks like this. No, that's just, that looks like a step. Yeah, that's I'm <laughs> <laughs>